This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Ghosts in the Attic. In this series, we ask the question... What if someone was hiding in your home, right under your nose, for weeks or even years, without your knowledge? While as unbelievable a scenario as that seems, I discovered several cases of people who hid themselves away under the stairs, in an attic or crawl space, waiting and watching the people who lived there, only emerging to commit a heinous crime. Our next story is so unbelievable, you'll probably think I made it up, but it's all true. This is the case of The Ghost in the Garret, Otto Sanhuber. Fred Osterich, a well-to-do factory owner living in Los Angeles, had been noticing some odd incidents occurring in his home for some time. Fred had opened a textile company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the early 1900s and made a fortune selling kitchen aprons and other sewn items. The business expanded over the years, and in 1918, Fred and his wife Dolly decided to open another factory in sunny California, where they could live out their golden years. Fred began considering retirement once he set up the new factory in Los Angeles, but he found that the challenge and excitement of opening a new business in the fast-growing city invigorated him. Instead of slowing down, Fred once again threw himself into his work, often spending 10 or even 12 hours per day at the factory. So when Fred returned home in the evenings, all he wanted was to have a hot meal, a drink or two, and maybe the evening paper before retiring to bed. Peace and quiet was what he craved after a long day. On one particular night, Fred was relaxing in his spacious home located at 858 North St. Andrews Place in the Melrose Hill neighborhood of Los Angeles when he was disturbed by a noise from upstairs. Half rising from his chair, he put down his paper. What the hell was that? he asked his wife, looking up at the ceiling. His wife, Dolly, sitting in the chair opposite him, was working on some knitting. She was the only other person in the home. She didn't look up at her husband as she answered, What was what, dear? Her disinterest caused Fred to become angry. This wasn't the first time he'd heard noises coming from above when no one else was home. He was sure he'd heard a thump, and as she was sitting in the same room, knew his wife had to have heard it, too. God damn it, Dolly, Fred sputtered. Don't tell me you didn't hear that noise coming from upstairs. Dolly put down her knitting and looked at her husband patiently. Now, dear, she said, if I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times. You're just working too hard. You really need to get more rest. You're hearing things again. It's very concerning, she said, her brow furrowed in sympathy. Fred paced the floor and headed towards the stairs. Dolly cut him off, saying, Look, just sit down, relax. Why don't we listen to some music? I'll refresh your drink. Come, come, sit here like a good boy, she added, beginning to stroke his brow. Fred began to calm down. He was tired, he conceded, as he allowed his wife to soothe his frazzled nerves. But later that week, another recurring incident caused Fred's anger to rise once again. He normally worked six or even seven days a week, but after spending a few hours one Saturday morning at the factory, he decided to return home in the afternoon and have a nice sandwich for lunch. He and Dolly had enjoyed a roast beef dinner on Friday, and there was a large slice of the meat left over. He'd been craving a roast beef sandwich all morning, so when he opened the icebox and saw the roast beef was gone, he was more than a little perturbed. Dolly, he shouted to his wife, where is the roast beef from last night? What roast beef, Dolly asked. Now, at this point in our story, I picture poor Fred grabbing his fedora off his head, crumpling it between his hands and throwing it in frustration on the floor, a la Oliver Hardy. The roast beef! I know there was some left from our dinner, Fred yelled. Dear, Dolly said soothingly, frustrating Fred even further. You ate all the roast beef. There was none left. Fred began yelling that he was certain he had not finished the roast beef. Dolly let him vent for a minute before cutting him off. 
Fred, you did so eat all the roast beef. You were so drunk, how can you remember anything you did last night? Although still frustrated, Fred stopped yelling and stomped out of the kitchen. Fred was a heavy drinker, and there were many nights that he'd stumble up to bed after draining a half a bottle of gin or even more. She could be right, he thought. Fred's drinking had begun in earnest in 1910. That was the year that Fred and Dolly Osterich suffered the greatest loss of their life, and neither was the same afterward. Fred William Osterich was born in Illinois in 1877. He married Walburga Korschel, called Dolly, when he was just 20 and she 18. Three years later, they had their first and only child, a son they named Raymond Harold. Fred and Dolly settled in Milwaukee. There, Fred founded a textile company, working long hours to make it a success. The factory's best-selling product was kitchen aprons. His company began filling large orders for department stores and food service companies. Before long, profits rose, and Fred was a wealthy man. He, Dolly, and Raymond moved into a bigger house. The two-story home, located at 378 11th Avenue, was located in a very nice neighborhood. Fred, in today's parlance, could be called a workaholic. Even after his company was running smoothly and at a profit, Fred spent many hours away from home at the factory. Dolly sometimes complained about his long hours, but after Raymond was born, she spent most of her time and energy doting on her boy. Raymond was a joy to his mother and father, and the apple of their eye. But in 1910, Raymond became ill. As his condition worsened, his parents grew frantic. Fred made sure his son got the best care money could buy, but in the end, there was nothing to be done. Raymond passed away at the age of 10. Fred and Dolly Osterick grieved the loss of their son deeply. But as is sometimes the case after a traumatic event, the couple didn't come together to support one another in their loss. Instead, they retreated into themselves and grew distant. This was particularly true of Fred. After Fred lost his son, he immersed himself in work and booze. The more he drank, the more short-tempered he became. A once kind and magnanimous boss, Fred became an impatient and unforgiving taskmaster with his workers, often bordering on cruel. But his temper wasn't only reserved for his employees. Fred became increasingly angry at home, where Dolly bore the brunt of his insults and criticism. When he wasn't ignoring her, Fred Osterich began heaping abuse upon his wife, at first verbal, but in later years becoming physical. After her child died, Dolly sought out her husband for comfort, but when he grew cold and distant, and then abusive, she stopped trying to connect with him. Instead, she merely tried to stay out of his way so as not to arouse his bad temper. Dolly was lonely, and some would later say she began seeking out the company of other men at this time. While this is merely a rumor inspired by later events, it would become a well-known fact that in 1913, Dolly did start spending time with another man. This would set off a series of events that would go down in the annals of crime as one of the strangest and most unusual cases in California history. I want to take a moment to tell you about a fabulous new podcast, Unjust and Unsolved. Maggie Freeling speaks to those who have been wrongfully convicted to hear their stories and try and bring justice to these cases. Here's Maggie to tell you more about Unjust and Unsolved. My name is Maggie Freeling. I'm an investigative journalist, and I'm excited to tell you about my new podcast from the Obsessed Network called Unjust and Unsolved. Each episode tells the story of a person who I believe has been wrongfully incarcerated. The Innocence Project gives a conservative estimate that there are over 20,000 innocent people locked away in U.S. prisons. When I learned this, I sent letters to those whose stories haunted me. I heard back from almost everyone. They all wanted to be heard. And so on Unjust and Unsolved, I'm doing just that. I speak with those people, their loved ones, advocates, and lawyers, diving deep into the crimes they were convicted of and presenting the evidence that points away from them. And if it wasn't them, then who was it? 
help me search for an answer. You can find Unjust and Unsolved and all Obsessed Network podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, EverlyWell. EverlyWell makes at-home lab testing easy. EverlyWell offers over 30 at-home lab tests like thyroid health, heart health, indoor and outdoor allergies, metabolism, and so many more. I was curious to know about my food sensitivities, so I ordered Everly Wells lab test. It was mailed to me with super easy instructions to take the test and return it by mail to Everly Wells lab. Tests are then reviewed by a board-certified physician, and in just a short amount of time, I received an email telling me my results were ready that I could then review online. I learned that I have normal sensitivity to most foods, but I found out I have moderate reactivity to egg whites. That was a surprise. Well, there goes those whiskey sours. <laughs> but seriously, having this information makes it much easier to make informed decisions to avoid foods that may cause me not to feel my best. That's information I need to have. To start understanding your health better, like I did, you need to check out Everly Well today. As a listener of this podcast, you can get 20% off an Everly Well at-home lab test by visiting everlywell.com slash once and enter code once at checkout. That's everlywell.com slash once and use code once for 20% off your test. Everlywell, at-home lab tests, your answers, your way. Dolly Osterich was a wealthy woman by 1913, but she was bored and lonely. Her husband Fred worked long hours and at night, spent his time drinking to assuage his grief over the death of his son. Dolly, without her son to care for, became a mother figure to her husband's employees. Fred's workers said that Mrs. Osterich was always a ray of sunshine when she visited the factory. Dressed to the nines, sometimes wearing one of her many fur coats, Dolly would bring in baked goods and other treats to the office. She remembered employees' birthdays, bringing them cards and small gifts. Dolly's attitude towards the employees was in sharp contrast to her husband's. Fred had become increasingly short-tempered, and when he wasn't berating his staff for not working fast enough, he was ignoring them, locked away in his office, going over the books. One of the factory employees that came to Dolly's attention was a teen named Otto Sandhuber. Otto was just 17 years old and had been hired as an all-around handyman. He could fix anything, and was often tasked with repairing the many sewing machines on the factory floor. Otto, born Otto Weir, had been orphaned when he was just a baby. He'd been adopted by the Sandhuber family in Milwaukee. He was something of a loner, and could often be found with his head in a dime store novel. He especially liked mysteries and crime stories. He was short and wore round, horn-rimmed glasses, which kind of made him look like an older version of Froggy from The Little Rascals. Dolly's first attraction to Otto may have been maternal. It's possible she knew or suspected the orphan was starved for motherly affection, but her interest in him changed at some point, as would be made clear one fine day in 1913. On that day, Dolly asked her husband to send his handyman over to the house. She told him her sewing machine was on the fritz and she wanted young Otto to take a look at it. When Otto arrived, he was surprised to see Mrs. Osterich answer the door wearing a silk robe. I mean, it was the middle of the day and all. She smiled at the boy and asked him to follow her upstairs to the bedroom, where her sewing machine was located, of course. Otto, toolbox in hand, followed his boss's wife upstairs. As he set about to repair the machine, Mrs. O sat behind him on the bed chatting with him. He turned around and saw that Mrs. O was wearing only a silk robe, with nothing underneath, and she wasn't being shy about it. She finally came out and told Otto what she really called him to her house for. Otto was shocked and surprised, pleasantly surprised. It didn't take much to convince him to take her up on her generous offer. After that day, Dolly found a number of things that needed to be fixed in the Osterich home, and Otto made many trips there during the hours when Mr. O was away. Dolly and Otto spent afternoons together in bed in the hours before Mr. O was expected home from work. But once Dolly ran out of excuses for Otto to be sent over, the secret lovers had to find other ways to meet so as not to arouse the suspicions of her husband. Sometimes they met at Otto's boarding house, sometimes at a hotel. But none of these were ideal. 
Some of Dolly's neighbors had already begun to talk, wondering why the young man was seen coming and going so frequently from the Osterich home. Then, Dolly took things a little too far. Otto had become a frequent visitor to the home, and Dolly thought she had successfully sold the idea to Fred that she was providing the boy with odd jobs to do, as well as serving as a maternal figure to the young man. But when Dolly took a trip to St. Louis, and Fred Osterich discovered that she'd taken Otto along with her, that was the last straw. Fred ordered Otto to stay away from his home and his wife, and fired him from his job. This would seem to be the end of the affair, as it were, but Dolly, ever resourceful, came up with a plan. Since he had no job and soon nowhere to live, Dolly suggested Otto move in with her. Wait, what, you're asking? Wasn't she still living with Fred? Yes, she was. Dolly's plan was for Otto to move into their attic. There he would hide until Fred went off to work, giving them the whole day together to spend at their pleasure. In the evenings, Otto would hide himself away in the attic once again. It was perfect, Dolly thought. Her lover wouldn't be observed by the neighbors, and Dolly could take care of him 24-7. And of course, Otto could take care of her needs while her husband spent long hours at the factory. Well, you might imagine this would be a crazy idea that would never work. But Dolly did make it work. Otto was ensconced in the attic, snug as a bug in a rug, with Fred Osterich none the wiser. But surely, you're asking, this could only have continued for a short time, I mean, a few days or a maximum of a week. Well, there you would be wrong as well. Dolly and Otto kept the secret going for years. From 1914 to 1918, Otto lived in the Osterich's attic in Milwaukee. But as Fred Osterich's wealth grew, he moved into bigger homes in nicer neighborhoods and Otto moved with them, of course, unknown to Fred. With each move, Dolly made sure to send Otto ahead to get his room in the attic set up before the couple moved in. Otto lived in four different attics in the Osterich's home over the years. And what was Otto doing for so many hours in the attic, you might ask? Well, he spent a lot of time reading the pulp detective stories he loved so much. Otto had always aspired to write, so, with his room and board taken care of, he had time to write several short stories that he hoped to submit to detective magazines. Now, like the scene I described at the beginning of the episode, there were some slip-ups. Over the years, Fred would think he'd heard something, like someone walking upstairs when he and Dolly were both downstairs. He'd also occasionally find one of his cigars missing, or some of his liquor bottles less full than he'd last remembered. And of course he'd noticed that food would sometimes go missing. Dolly always had a ready excuse for her husband at these times. He was hearing things, Dolly would tell him. He was working too hard. He was drunk and imagining things. It was true that Fred Osterich did drink too much. Perhaps he believed his wife's excuses. Maybe he suspected she was having an affair, but didn't want to confront the problem, so convinced himself he believed her excuses. Or maybe... He was just exhausted from working too much and then staying up late drinking and didn't want to be bothered. Whatever the reason, things continued the same way, with Dolly and Otto continuing their secret relationship, Otto hiding in the attic, and Fred remaining in the dark. This went on for four long years. In 1918, Fred Osterich decided to expand his business into California. Perhaps he was tired of the frigid Milwaukee winters and wanted to move to a warmer climate. California was booming in the early 1900s, and when Fred saw an opportunity to open another factory on the West Coast, he took it. By this time, young Otto was now a 22-year-old man. When he learned about the move, he told Dolly he planned to join the Army. The United States had entered World War I the previous spring, and most young men his age had already enlisted to fight for their country. Dolly wouldn't hear of it. Instead, she told her husband that she was willing to move to California, but she had one condition, that the house they purchased had to come equipped with an attic. This was not as easy to find in California as it was in Wisconsin. Attics were fairly uncommon in West Coast homes, but Fred was able to find one. 
The house was located at 858 North St. Andrews Place, just blocks from Melrose Avenue. Dolly once again sent Otto on ahead to move into the attic and await her arrival. One added benefit of Otto living in Dolly's home was that he took over most of the household chores. Unable to leave the house and with hours on his hands every day, Otto took care of cleaning the house, washing clothes, and other tasks that, according to Dolly, Fred was, quote, too cheap to hire help to do. Fred did wonder why there was a padlock on the door to the attic, but Dolly was able to explain it away, saying she wanted to keep her furs safe. Dolly always kept the key with her. Truth be told, Fred didn't question his wife too much about anything. Otto did get a few nights out of the attic each month, even if he couldn't leave the house. Now living in Los Angeles, Fred enjoyed going out for a nice steak dinner or sometimes to social gatherings with business colleagues and their wives. Dolly would get dressed up, don one of her furs, and just before leaving the house, would release the trap door to the attic. This gave Otto the opportunity to leave the attic and head downstairs to eat, drink, and smoke cigars. Fred began hearing strange noises once again, just like he had in Milwaukee. But Dolly often told him it was just noises a new house made when it settled. If there was one thing that bothered Otto the most while stuck in his attic lair, it was hearing Fred yell at Dolly. The couple began to argue more frequently, and when he'd been drinking, Fred would become very loud and verbally abusive. Dolly had told Otto that sometimes in his anger, Fred would grab her arm or wrist and push her. Otto couldn't stand hearing this. The reality was that for years, Otto had been in love with Dolly. She took care of him, fed him, clothed him, and in some ways, he must have thought of her as the mother he never had a chance to know. But she was also his lover, and beyond that, literally the only person in his life for his entire young adult life. Otto wanted Dolly to leave her husband and marry him, but she always explained that she could not do this, as she had no money of her own. If she left Fred, she'd have nothing, she told Otto. Dolly said the best they could do was keep things the same. She assured Otto that she could handle her husband and would be fine. But everything came to a head one night in August 1922. On the evening of the 22nd, Fred and Dolly went out to a party. When they returned, Fred was drunk and the couple began arguing. The yelling became loud, alerting Otto. He heard Dolly cry out and then a loud thump. Otto, afraid Dolly was being hurt, grabbed two 25 caliber pistols and ran from his hiding place in the attic and down the stairs. Otto saw Dolly lying on the floor where she'd fallen. Later, she would report that Fred had grabbed her arm and she'd backed away, slipping on a rug and falling. Otto, thinking Dolly was being beaten, rushed towards Fred. Fred only had a moment to figure out what he was seeing. This small man had run down his stairs and now he recognized him. He was the handyman that he'd fired years ago, the one who'd been too friendly with his wife. Fred's face briefly flickered with recognition, then surprise, then rage. You son of a bitch, he yelled at Otto. Then, to his wife, he spat out angrily, I knew it! He lunged for Otto, grabbing his arm that held the gun pointed at him. At that moment, Otto fired, but the bullet's trajectory went up into the air, lodging it into the ceiling. Otto was able to lift his other hand, which held the second gun, and fire it three times in rapid succession. Two bullets struck Fred in the chest, and one struck him in the head. Fred Osterich fell dead onto the floor. Otto and Dolly stood frozen in shock, but when they came to their senses, they knew they had to come up with a plan quickly to explain the shooting without implicating either one of them they decided to stage an attempted burglary. Dolly took the diamond-studded watch Fred always wore off his wrist and gave it to Otto to hide. She entered her bedroom closet, which Otto then locked from the outside. She instructed him to toss the key into the living room. Otto then returned to the attic to hide. After he was safely hidden, Dolly began screaming for help and neighbors alerted the police. When they arrived, they found Fred Osterich dead on his living room floor, and Mrs. Osterich calling pitifully for her husband while locked in the closet. Dolly told officers that after she and her husband had returned home from a night out, she'd gone into her closet to dress for bed. 
She'd had her back to the door when it slammed shut, and she heard the key turn in the lock, locking her in. She called to her husband, thinking he'd done it as a joke, but then she'd heard men yelling and the sound of gunshots. That's when she must have fainted, she said. She had come to some time later and called for help. Police canvassed the neighborhood, but no one had seen anything out of place that night. They hadn't witnessed anyone except Mr. and Mrs. Osterick come or go from their home. The detective's suspicions were aroused when Dolly told them her husband's watch was missing, but then they discovered his wallet still in his pocket, with a significant amount of cash left inside. They were also alerted by friends and neighbors that the Osterichs could frequently be heard fighting and arguing, but when Dolly was asked about the relationship, she said they never fought. Witnesses also told detectives that the couple had gotten into an argument at the party they'd attended the night Fred was killed. Fred Osterich was a wealthy man, and he and his wife had an acrimonious relationship, two things the detectives believe could motivate a wife to shoot her husband. But there was just one problem. Detectives couldn't figure out how Dolly had managed to lock herself inside the closet. There was only one key that fit the lock, and it had been found on the other side of the house. Because of this, they couldn't make a case against Dolly, and they had uncovered no other suspects. Fred Osterich's murder remained a mystery. Dolly and Otto moved out of the murder house and into a smaller home on North Beachwood Drive. Did they now live as a proper couple, out in the open? That would be a no. Dolly once again made sure to find a house with an attic, and Otto, once again, made it his home. Dolly's husband was dead, and her longtime lover continued to live in her attic. At first, she explained that Otto needed to stay hidden lest someone discover the affair and alert the police to his presence. This could cause her locked-in-the-closet alibi to unravel, and he would be charged with Fred's murder. So Otto remained in the attic, even while Dolly began another relationship. After her husband's death, Fred's attorney, Herman Shapiro, was tasked with settling his estate. Dolly began spending time with the lawyer, and soon they were involved in a romantic relationship. Poor Otto was still up in the attic, but by this time, his life was pretty much controlled by his long-term lover-slash-mother figure. Weird, I know. He knew that Dolly was sleeping with Mr. Shapiro, but didn't feel he could say or do anything about it. When Fred was alive, Otto's attic room was located directly above the Osterich's bedroom, and he could hear them making love. He didn't like it, but Otto didn't have any control over Dolly or her other relationships. Which is pretty heartless on Dolly's part, if you think about it. I mean, he had killed for her, and she still made him live in the attic while she slept with other men, literally under his nose. But Dolly, probably feeling she had the world by the tail at this point, became careless. One day, police captain Herman Klein called on Shapiro. It had been nearly a year since Fred Osterich's murder, and Captain Klein had been in charge of the investigation. Klein had been suspicious of Dolly Osterich since day one, and made sure to keep tabs on her over the subsequent months. Klein stopped by Shapiro's office to ask him a follow-up question about the case when he noticed an item on the attorney's desk. It was a diamond-studded watch, exactly like the one Dolly described as stolen from her husband on the night of his murder. The watch was unmistakable, as the face of it was a hexagon shape with small diamonds set around it. The captain asked Shapiro about the watch. He told him it had been a gift from Dolly. This pricked up Klein's ears even more. Pretty nice gift, he told Shapiro, jokingly asking him what he'd done to deserve it. Shapiro admitted that he and the widow Osterich had been seeing each other romantically for the past few months. He explained that Dolly told him she'd discovered the watch underneath a window seat cushion. She hadn't bothered to report this to the police, saying that she didn't see how it mattered now. She had then given the watch to her new boyfriend as a gift. But Shapiro wasn't the only man that Dolly was spending time with. Herman Shapiro didn't know about her attic lover, Otto Sanhuber, but he also didn't know about Roy Klum. Klum was a neighbor of Dolly's. He was also a movie producer and owned a production company in Hollywood. Dolly had started a relationship with Klum and then sweet-talked him into doing her a favor. She told him she had a gun that, quote, looked similar to the gun that had killed her husband. 
She wanted to get rid of it because she was afraid the police would find it and suspect her of murdering Fred. She asked Clum if he wouldn't mind very much disposing of it for her. Clum, under Dolly's spell apparently, agreed. The La Brea tar pits were located just down the road from Dolly's neighborhood. Clum thought this would be the ideal place to ditch the gun. The La Brea tar pits are a natural phenomenon located in Los Angeles County, where thick natural asphalt bubbles up to the surface, forming ponds or pools. Anything that falls into them tends to get stuck or trapped in its tar-like substance. This is where Clum took the gun, throwing it into one of the tar pits. Captain Klein always believed that the type of weapon used in Fred Osterich's murder held a clue. Fred had been killed with a twenty-two caliber pistol, not a weapon commonly used to commit a violent robbery, as it was very small. It was, as the captain described, quote, more of a lady's gun, unquote, something that could easily be carried in a handbag or purse. Not long after Captain Klein discovered that Dolly was dating her dead husband's lawyer, he got a visit from another one of Dolly's boyfriends. Roy Clum had recently been dumped by Dolly and now decided to spill the beans about the discarded gun. Klein now saw the pieces of the puzzle coming together. Meanwhile, searchers converged at the La Brea tar pits. The captain thought it was a long shot that they'd find anything there after nearly a year, but upon searching the area Clum directed them to look, they were amazed to find the weapon almost immediately. Clum had not thrown it very far out into the oozing liquid, so the gun had landed in a shallow area near the edge of the tar pit, where it was easily discovered. On July 12, 1923, 11 months after the murder of Fred Osterick, Dolly Osterick was arrested and charged with the crime. Upon reading about her arrest in the paper, Dolly's neighbor, a man named J.E. Faber, came into the police station with a second gun. He told detectives that Dolly had given him a 22 caliber pistol as well, providing the same explanation about getting rid of the gun lest the police think she had anything to do with Fred's murder. Faber told the officers he'd buried it under a rose bush in his yard and took them to it. Police hoped showing Dolly the guns they'd found would cause her to crumble and confess to the murder. But they underestimated her because, cool as a cucumber, Dolly answered, why, those old guns had just been around the house for years. She told the police chief that she had decided to get rid of them because, under the circumstances of her husband's death, their presence in her home might prove embarrassing. Even so, Dolly was booked into jail under suspicion of murder and held without bail. Dolly Osterick, now sitting in a jail cell charged with her husband's murder, became frantic. Not for her own predicament, but for her lover, poor Otto Sandhuber, who still sat locked away in her attic. Dolly's boyfriend, Herman Shapiro, visited Dolly in jail soon after her arrest. She asked him to do her a favor, and it needed to be done quickly, she said. Now, I know this is going to sound a bit strange, Dolly began, but I need you to pick up some groceries and take them to my house. When you get there, go into my bedroom, enter the closet, and tap on the ceiling. Shapiro must have looked at her as if she'd lost her mind. It was all easily explained, Dolly said. See, she had been caring for her vagabond brother, she said. He was a bit odd and preferred to stay in the attic. He would be afraid to come out if there was a stranger in the house, so Shapiro needed to call up to him and let him know Dolly had sent him and it was okay to come out. Shapiro did think this odd, but believed Dolly's story and followed her instructions. To his amazement, when he tapped on the closet ceiling and called out, a somewhat short, slender man descended from the attic space. He said he was very hungry and Shapiro told him Dolly had sent him to bring food. At first, Otto gave Shapiro a false name. But after a few minutes while he ate, he began sharing details of his life with the attorney. Otto, starved for attention and information about Dolly, remember, he'd seen or spoken only to Dolly for the past 10 years, began to spill out his entire story to Shapiro, including his real name and the truth of his longtime relationship with Dolly. Shapiro was shocked to find out that this man had been living in Dolly's attic the whole time he'd been dating her. He'd spent plenty of time in Dolly's house and never had a clue. Instead of becoming angry with Dolly and hoping she'd rot in jail, 
Shapiro decided to help Otto get out of town. That way, Shapiro figured, he'd have Dolly all to himself. Shapiro found Otto a place to live and a job in San Francisco. Otto packed up his things, including the typewriter he'd had Dolly purchase for him after Fred's death. He still spent his days writing his detective stories, and there are reports that he was able to sell a few of them to magazines. I'd imagine if he'd written a story based on his real-life adventures, it might have become a bestseller. But then again, it probably was too far-fetched for anyone to believe. As to how Dolly took the news that Otto had been sent packing by Shapiro, we can only guess. But after a month, the judge allowed her release on a $50,000 bond. Dolly had become very ill while in jail, and her attorney asked for a compassionate release, which was granted upon the bond being put up, guaranteeing she'd show up for trial in the future. Investigators had the murder weapons, but they proved not to be much help since they were both too damaged and corroded to prove that they had been connected to Fred Osterich's murder. And they still had not solved the mystery of how Dolly had shot her husband and then locked herself in a closet from the outside. The investigation continued, but no new evidence came to light. Eighteen months later, the murder charge against Dolly was dismissed due to lack of evidence. By then, Dolly and Herman Shapiro were living together in her home. Otto Sanhuber, now calling himself Walter Klein, had since returned to Los Angeles. After a short time in San Francisco, Otto had moved to Canada. There he met a woman and they married. He brought his new bride, Mathilde, with him to California. Otto did not contact Dolly, but he would soon regret ever returning to Los Angeles nonetheless. By 1930, Dolly Osterich and Herman Shapiro had been together for seven years. That year, Dolly broke up with Shapiro, and he moved out of her house. Angry over the breakup, Shapiro finally decided to come clean and tell the police everything he knew about Dolly and her attic-dwelling boyfriend. Armed with this information, detectives finally had the last piece of the puzzle. They realized that Dolly had been able to pull off the murder of her husband because of an unbelievable twist in the story. The killer had been hiding in her home the entire time and had conspired with her to stage the fake burglary. He had been the one to lock Dolly in the closet before hiding himself once again in the rafters. Police sought out Otto Sandhuber, a.k.a. Walter Klein, now living in Los Angeles, and arrested him for the murder of Fred Osterich. Dolly was rearrested and charged with conspiracy. When the details of the bizarre case hit the newspapers, it became a media sensation. Otto Sandhuber was dubbed the Ghost in the Garret and the Attic Lover, but the nickname most often repeated was the Batman. Interestingly, this was not a reference to the DC Comics hero Batman. That character was not created until almost a decade into the future. I guess some creative reporter pictured the short, slightly built Sandhuber hanging upside down like a bat in Dolly Osterich's attic. Seventeen years had passed since Dolly and Otto met and began their affair. He was now 36. Dolly was 50. Otto had lived in Dolly's attic for a decade, shot and killed her husband, and nobody ever had a clue he was there. It was a pretty amazing story. But now, both he and Dolly were facing prison sentences, and Sandhuber might even face the hangman's noose, which was still the method of execution in California in 1930 their prospects of seeing freedom again looked pretty bleak. But the prosecutor couldn't make a case for Fred Osterich's murder being premeditated, so the charge against Sandhuber was reduced to manslaughter. His attorney argued that the statute of limitations for manslaughter was seven years, and Osterich had been killed eight years earlier. His attorney was able to successfully argue that he could not be convicted of the crime at this late date. The judge agreed, and he was released. Otto Sandhuber immediately left town. Where he went or what name he used once he got there is unknown. <music> Dolly was still facing her trial for the crime of conspiracy to commit murder. She was able to afford a top-notch Los Angeles attorney, Jerry Geisler. Geisler had defended a number of high-profile clients, including actor and director Charlie Chaplin, and mobster Bugsy Siegel. 
Dolly took the stand in her own defense. Since Otto could not be punished for his part in the crime, she thought her best strategy was to place the blame squarely on his shoulders. He was jealous of her husband, she said, and saw an opportunity to kill him one night when Fred was too drunk to defend himself. Yes, her husband had been violent with her, Dolly said, but she'd never asked San Huber to kill him. The jury was unable to reach a verdict, and a mistrial was declared. When it was reported that most of the jury had leaned towards acquittal, the district attorney decided not to retry the case. Dolly was also set free. Dolly Osterich lived quietly for the remainder of her life, and it was a long one. She would enter into a 30-year relationship with her business manager, Ray Burt Hedrick. Although they lived together for three decades, she would not marry him until two weeks before her death in 1961 at the age of 80. She left behind a multi-million dollar estate, which she willed to Hedrick. Her will made no mention of Otto Sanhuber. The strange case of Dolly Osterich and Otto Sanhuber inspired a number of books and films. In 1968, a comedy starring Shirley MacLaine and Richard Attenborough, titled The Bliss of Mrs. Blossom, was loosely based on Dolly Osterich. Then in 1995, a made-for-TV movie titled The Man in the Attic was released. It more closely resembled the real crime story. Anne Archer plays the character based on Dolly, and a very young Neil Patrick Harris plays the Otto Sanhuber character. The house in Los Angeles where Otto lived in the attic and Fred Osterich was killed was still standing in the 1990s. It had been divided into nine separate apartments. One of the rented apartments had formerly been the home's attic. That will do it for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy and looking forward to a very happy Halloween. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia, and original music for the show is by Aaron Michael Goldberg. Until next time, be good to one another. Thank you.